you are our lives, Lord God. And we look to you, Lord, and we thank you for the grace that we have in you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, and let's turn in our Bibles to Galatians chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 16. But we're dealing with a, with a really important issue there. And as Paul has been dealing up to this point, and he's, he's coming to and dealing with, as we're looking at today, the defense of the gospel. And as we've seen, he's defending it against the Judaizers, against legalism. But today it seems like, well, and there's always, it's true throughout history, there's always that need, there's always the necessity of defending the gospel because for them back then it was legalism. It was trying to add to the gospel to say, yes, it's great that you receive Jesus, you receive the grace of God, but there's something needed to be added to that, whether it be for them, it was keeping the Old Testament law, or whatever that might be. We have kind of like the mirror image of that, the opposite kind side of the coin these days, when we have people that would say that you really, that really you can receive Jesus and then do whatever you want to do. It's the opposite side of the coin, whereas there's one side, there's the legalism. On the other side, there's what's referred to as the license. The license or the feeling that you ha can do if you've gone forward at a service, you've prayed a prayer, you're good to go, go out and do whatever you want. And so this is the core struggle. It's that battle over the gospel of the grace of God. And if we don't stay true to the gospel of grace, we'll find that either we're brought in bondage, as we'll see, either to the law or to the flesh, to our own old natures. Paul's letter to the Galatians has been referred to as a defense of the gospel of grace. Here he is writing at this time in A.D. 49, and he had visited them on his first missionary journey about a year earlier. And since that time, this group came probably from Jerusalem or Judea, known as the Judaizers, who taught the people that it wasn't enough to just believe in Jesus, but they had to keep the law, the Old Testament law, in order to be saved. It would be like people today, and you may have heard some people say, well, well what do you have to do to be pleasing? Well, you have to keep the Ten Commandments. Okay, good luck with that. Because if you read them and you get, like Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, behind that, the, you know, the motivation behind that, you know, you don't go five minutes without breaking it because of the intent of our hearts. Now, this group came in there teaching they had to keep the law. Paul hears this and responds by writing this letter defending the true gospel. His defense includes three parts as we've talked about before, but by way of review, the first, in the first two chapters, chapters one and two, is his personal defense of the gospel of grace. In chapters three and four is his theological or scriptural defense of the gospel of grace. And then in chapters five and six is the practical or applicational defense of the gospel of grace. But this morning, we are going to continue with Paul's personal defense of the gospel and how it was confirmed in his life, how God, how it played out through his experience. First of all, in verses 1 through 5, we're going to see that the gospel is defended against legalism. 
And then secondly, in verses 6 through 10, we'll see that it's, the gospel is defended against divisiveness. And then thirdly, in verses 11 through 16, we'll see the gospel's defended against hypocrisy. Now, all of this really gets back to the, to the same thing of adding to the gospel and how this takes place, but we'll see again how this plays out. But first of all, the gospel defended against legalism. We'll begin by reading the first two verses here. As it says, then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. The point will be germane in a moment. And I went up by revelation and communicated to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. As we saw last time, Paul returned to Jerusalem three years after his conversion and met with Peter and James. The point was then and is now as well that he received the gospel that he preached through the revelation of Jesus Christ and he was not taught it by anyone else. He didn't go to a gospel school somewhere to learn the gospel. It was during those three years in the wilderness where, or in the desert that he, was, he received it from the Lord as he says in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. As he says, I'm sharing you this, with the, you this gospel that I received from the Lord. Now, Paul speaks of the next time he came to Jerusalem, 14 years later. Now, things have transpired, obviously, in those 14 years. After the, that earlier visit, three years after he was saved, if you remember from the book of Acts, he kind of got things stirred up in Jerusalem like he tended to do in the places where he went. And he went to back home to Tarsus in Cilicia, which is modern-day Turkey. It's closer in though to Asia, closer to Syria. So he was up there for a while. Then later, Barnabas, who was in Antioch, goes up to Tarsus, gets Saul at the time, name hadn't been changed yet, brings him back to Antioch, and so he spends a number of years um, there teaching the people, teaching the church there in Antioch, and then moving up in leadership and expanding in ministry in different ways. Now, he was there now in Jerusalem on a particular mission with Barnabas and Titus, but he was not there to study in, under anyone else. Again, this is what he's trying to make perfectly clear to these people in Galatia who, you know, some were trying to say, oh, Paul's not a real legitimate apostle. He's either ripped what he's teaching off from somewhere else or it's not the same gospel that the apostles are teaching. So you have this contention going on. So he's trying to make everything perfectly clear. He wants, and this is the issue, to be perfectly clear about the gospel, about what the gospel is. And really, isn't today that the problem as well? How many people think, you know, so many different things about the gospel, as I mentioned before, the legalism or the license. But he wants to make it perfectly clear. He states that he went up to Jerusalem this time by revelation or under the express direction of God that God told him to go to Jerusalem. And it's most likely that this is the trip that's referred to in Acts chapter 11 verses 27 through 30 to bring famine relief. A famine had taken place. Remember back then in Acts 11, you had a prophet named Agabus 
who shows up a couple of times in the book of Acts, he goes to, down to Antioch and prophesies that there's going to be a famine. And then it happened later and hit specifically um, Judea and the area around Jerusalem. So either because of this prophecy or specific direction given to him by the Lord, he goes up to Jerusalem bringing famine relief to the Jewish believers there. On this trip, he meets privately with the apostles that are there to make sure that he is not running in vain. The point is that the gospel doesn't change. And that he received it from Jesus personally. If the apostles didn't concur with the gospel of grace that he was preaching, it would do damage to his ministry among the Gentiles. You see, that's what the point is here. It's not that, oh, he's not saying, oh, am I preaching the right gospel? He wasn't questioning the gospel that he had received specifically from the Lord. He was going up there and he wanted to make sure they were preaching the same gospel because he couldn't be responsible for anybody other than himself and, you know, am I doing what the Lord told me to do? But he wanted to concur with them so that if they were teaching something different, it wouldn't mess up his ministry to the Gentiles. That's the issue. He didn't want them getting mixed messages. He wanted, every, he wanted them to know the gospel and know what the gospel was. And know that they could be confident in their salvation. Paul had had an encounter with the Lord and spent three years with him in the wilderness. He went into the wilderness with the Lord. And some say he went into the, express it this way, in that he went into the wilderness with the Lord and with the law and basically came out with Romans and Galatians. Not that he wrote the letters there, but that it formed in his mind, in his heart, the truth of the gospel. So in Romans, you get the theological explanation of salvation and grace, and in Galatians, you get the defense of the gospel. It's critical to your Christian life, to my Christian life, that you have a grip on the grace of God and what it means to be saved by grace. It means that if we repent of our sins and place our faith in Jesus Christ alone for our salvation, we are forgiven. The grace of God, you might have heard the acronym, you probably heard God's riches at Christ's expense. That's what the grace of God is, that we can be saved because We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of eternal life, the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the gospel. Now, the problem is, as I said, people either add to it or take away from it. You have the condition in the church today where some feel that they can just, they come in, hear a moving message in a church, go forward, pray, and then think they can go out and live however they will. Hey, I prayed the prayer. Doesn't matter if I get drunk. Doesn't matter if I do whatever else. I prayed the prayer. Like Paul wrote to the Romans in chapter 6, raising the hypothetical question. He said, should we then sin that grace should abound? Man, if I want to experience grace, I need to keep sinning so I can keep experience grace, experiencing grace. He say, and he said there, may it never be. May that never happen is literally what it says. That shouldn't be the case. Because that's not what grace is about. Grace is not a license to sin. Grace is the enablement to live a life that's pleasing to God because of what he's accomplished. 
not what we do. You see, when it's about what we do, then you go into the side of legalism. It's about what he's accomplished. And this is so incredibly cool. And why it is so critical to the Christian life is not only are you saved by grace, but you live the Christian life by grace too. Every day, uh, you know, you can wake up and, and think, oh, you know, you're out, you had, maybe you slept late and you got up, you have to run out the door and it's like, oh man, God can't bless me today because I didn't have my quiet time. If that's the case, we're all in trouble. It's the grace of God. And it's not that you presume on that and then he's, oh, I don't have to worry about having a quiet time then. No, that's not the case. It's the enabling. The grace is the enabling to live the Christian life. And so that's the point. That's the heart of what Paul's getting at here. And why it's so critically important that we understand and why he, he would stand up to anybody. And we'll see in a few minutes that he did. For the sake of the gospel. That they would know the true gospel. That they wouldn't get diverted into thinking, oh man, I got to keep the Ten Commandments. Oh, I got to be circumcised. Oh, I got to keep the dietary laws. And they weren't even Jewish. And they were being put under this. So it's critical to your relationship with the Lord that you understand grace. Not that we'll ever fully understand it because we, the more we experience it, the more we're blown away by it. But Lord, you would just step in and work in my life by your grace. Now, in verses three through four we read, Yet even, or yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And this occurred because of uh, false brethren secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. So Titus was another one of those sons in the faith that Paul had, like Timothy. In fact, in Titus 1.4, Paul refers to him as my son in the faith. That means he's someone he, who came along, ministered, excuse me, with him, trained him, you know, discipled him, brought him up in the Lord, and sent him out to pastor in different places. He was culturally Greek, so at that time, in that place, naturally he was not circumcised. This would bring the issue of grace versus law to the head, to a head. Here goes. Here he comes in to Jerusalem. Paul come, and Barnabas come into Jerusalem. Come before the leadership of the church there in Jerusalem, and they bring in a Gentile. Because remember, the church in Jerusalem was predominantly Gent, uh, excuse me, Jewish, and some of those people, as would be described later, were zealous for the law. Oh brought a Gentile in here. But the point he makes here is that they're in their understanding of the gospel of grace was they didn't say, they didn't stop Titus at the door and say, hey dude, you want to come in here? You got to go get circumcised first. You got to go show you're observing the law. He didn't do that. They didn't do that. Because if keeping the law was normative, was required by the apostles and normative for all the Christians, then certainly they would have required him to be circumcised. And that's the point Paul's making. They, you see, the Judaizers who had come to Galatia were saying, we're trying to make this distinction between Paul and the other apostles, saying, Paul's not a real apostle. He, he's the cheap discount version. 
And then you have the guys in Jerusalem. But he's saying, no, they're in agreement with me. They, did, they didn't require Titus to be circumcised. Notice that Paul refers to these people as false brethren because, of the, because if the gospel you preach is grace plus something else, it's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you believe some other gospel, you're not saved. He refers to them as false brethren. When you don't stand firm on the gospel of grace, you allow people to bring you under bondage to the law if you don't stand firm on it. And I've spoken to people these days, I've talked to people in the past few years that believe Gentiles are obligated to keep Jewish feasts. And you think, in this day and age, are you serious? Absolutely. They think they're adding law to the gospel. And we just can't, it's a thing that we can't stand for. This is a hill to die on. Because if we get off of it, then people aren't believing the gospel. They're believing something else. It might seem like a little thing as, and a subtle thing as we're talking about it. But you can't add anything to the grace of God. That's the issue. You can't add anything to the grace of the God. His grace is complete. His grace is enough. We sang it. Your grace is enough. Do you think there's anything that you can add to his grace in order to be saved or, order, or in order to live or mature in the Christian life? Nothing. Nothing. In verse 5, he continues, to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Paul rightfully refused to be brought under bondage to the law or to allow anyone else to be brought under bondage to the law either. As it says in Jude, verse 3, when he started, when Jude started writing his little letter, he, he begins here by saying, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, that's what Jude wanted to write about. He said, I want to write this great letter to you guys about how cool it is, how awesome this salvation we have in the Lord is. And he just kind of wanted a glory in that for a while. But he said then, something changed his mind, and, and, and he says, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. That's the gospel. It doesn't change. But they needed to contend for it. They needed to stand firm for it. There were attacks coming from different places dealing with it. So Paul confronts the situation in Jerusalem because of the effect that allowing a deviant doctrine would have on the church. The truth of the gospel must be defended and man maintained so it will remain in order that people can believe and be saved. It's a tragedy to me when I go into or hear about maybe a traditional or a mainline church or a liberal church or something like you go in and you hear and there's never a presentation of the gospel. There's just this kind of like, you, it's almost like you want to describe as a common aura or something like that. You just go in there and we just kind of believe. Just kind of like just generic faith. And that's another thing to be aware of these days. As you, you know, hear this talk, well, at least we're people of faith. Oh, that's great. What faith? Faith in what? 
What are you talking about? Well, at least he has faith. Well, I can have faith in the music stand. What good is that going to do me? Faith is only good as the article in which you place that faith. A person can have faith in Buddha. They can have faith in Allah. They can have faith in Krishna. And the world would say, that's wonderful. They have faith. They are people of faith. And you hear these generic discussions. You have conventions of people getting together in Spain and thing like, things like that at Fatima, and they're all people of faith. Does it absolutely nothing for them. Because it's only in faith in Jesus Christ alone who saved, because there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. No other. Now, this is why it's not a side issue. It's the issue, salvation by grace alone through faith alone. So beware of letting anything else creep in, either legalism or license. Now, in, so now we've seen the gospel defended against legalism. Now in verses 6 through 10, we're going to see the gospel defended against divisiveness. Because as I said, these people were caught, trying to cause division between Paul and and the other apostles, not that they were dividing, but they wanted the church or the people in Galatia or other churches to divide over them, thinking Paul was a cheap discount version of an apostle, and you had the legit guys that were in Jerusalem so they could get them into legalism, presenting that they're Jewish up there, so we have to keep the Jewish law, we have to do all of those things. So... He begins here in verse 6 by saying, but those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it means, uh, or it makes no difference to me. God shows no favoritism or shows favoritism to no man. For those who seemed to be something added nothing to me. Paul continues his point that the other apostles did not add anything to the gospel that he preached. There was nothing. They didn't say, Paul, you're, not, you're short on this point here. He didn't, they didn't say that whatsoever. They said, well, you're right on there, Paul. But he's saying here, and the point he's making to these people is that he refused to recognize their reputation or celebrity status, not a status they were taking on themselves, but on these other people who were placing on them, elevating people. It's always a danger to when you elevate people. There's a danger of taking someone's word simply because of who they are and not whether they are consistent with the gospel. He respected their apostolic authority and he wasn't by any means dissing them, but just simply saying, you know, it's not a matter of just saying, oh, there are apostles up there. We, gotta, we have to believe them. Are they consistent with the word? The issue is the truth of the gospel. And they were in totally in agreement with Paul in reference to that. The Judaizers were trying to elevate the other apostles to make a distinction between them and Paul. Paul, or excuse me, God doesn't show personal favoritism toward anyone. In fact, Peter, when he was in uh, Caesarea, when God had led him to the house of Cornelius, the centurion, 
the Roman, the Gentile, and how he was the first was to bring was the first to welcome Gentiles into the church. And it says in Acts chapter 10, verse 34, then Peter opened his mouth and said, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality and that he, God stepped in and saved the Gentiles there the same way he saved the Jews. No distinction. Then in Romans chapter 2, verse 11, Paul says, for there is no partiality with God. Don't take a person's word for something simply because of who they are. God shows no partiality. The truth is the truth. Don't believe somebody who says something just because they have a name or they have a big presence on YouTube. In fact, in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, we read about the Bereans. It says, these were more, were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. These guys in Berea, and Luke, who's writing this, writing the book of Acts, he's making this observation. He's saying, guys, this is really cool. Look at this. These Bereans? And remember, Luke was a traveling companion. He was Paul's personal doctor. And he's writing this, and he said, look at these Bereans, isn't this cool? Look at this. They were listening to Paul. You know, the apostle Paul. They were listening to him. And what did they do? They were like, there were their Bibles looking up and down. You know, is that right? You know, it's, they were checking it out. They were checking it out. They didn't think, oh, this is Paul the apostle. We don't question him. You question everybody. You compare everybody to the scripture. That's your responsibility. As a believer, as a disciple of Christ, that's your responsibility. Verses 7 through 8, he continues. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcision had been committed to me, as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter for he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. There are not two separate gospels. There's not a Jewish gospel and a Gentile gospel. There's one gospel, but the gospel is applied, the gospel, the same gospel is applied to every culture, every people group. There is a false teaching going around in some circles in the church referred to as dual covenants. That's the idea that, well, there's one covenant with God for the Gentiles, they're saved by faith in Jesus Christ. There's another gospel or covenant with the Jews in that they're saved in keeping the law. That's not true. Basically, it's heretical. There's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man comes to the Father except through me. Clear, cut and dry, one gospel. Many applications to people in different situations of the gospel, how they receive the gospel, but it's the same gospel. The packaging might be different at different times, but the gospel remains the same.
it became very apparent to the other apostles that God was working through Paul's ministry. And this is great when you can recognize that the difference that you have with someone else is just because they have a different ministry. The gospel still, again, remains the same. It could be that one person is an evangelist and another's a pastor teacher. They approach things completely different. The evangelist is concerned with bringing people into the kingdom. So they're presenting the gospel in a clear way in order for people to understand how to receive Christ and become a Christian. The pastor teacher is equipping the saints, as it says in Ephesians 4.11, equipping the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. So you have different ministries, the same gospel. It could be that one is called to minister to the homeless and the other is called to lead worship. Their focus in ministry is going to be different. The gospel remains the same. It's God that works through and confirms a person's ministry. I love it in Colossians 4.17. Verse is always a challenge to me. Paul, he's, when he's, he writes this letter to the Colossians, probably written roughly around the same time as his letter to the Ephesians, he writes it to him, and he stops towards the end of the letter and makes this note, and it says, and he's writing to the pastor there, and he says, and say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord that you might fulfill it. Take heed to the ministry that he's given you. Go after it that you might fulfill it. Continuing in Galatians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, we read, And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I, uh, which I also was eager to do. So Paul speaks of the ministry that God had given him as a grace. Notice that. As he, as he said, they perceived the grace that had been given to me. The sole basis upon which God works in and through anyone's life is by grace. This is why you have to be careful when you think, you know, and our tendency is always to elevate people. And like, say, someone like a Billy Graham. And it's also, you know, you can talk about how great Billy Graham was. But, you know, it was all God's grace or a Chuck Smith or anyone else in you that we admire. And there's not a problem with admiring him and having respect for him. But you certainly don't want to try to be them. Because that's not the grace of God working in your life. The grace of God working in your life is for what he wants you to be, not for what he wanted them to be. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 15.10, Paul writes, But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me, which was with me, excuse me. So it's that grace of God operating, knowing, understanding the grace of God working in his life, that God's simply working in your life for his plan and his purposes. And why this is so incredibly important is because we sometimes think, well, I've done something wrong. God can't use me. Or here's a big one. I didn't have my quiet time this morning. I had to run out. I woke up late. 
had to run out the door. God certainly can't use me today because I didn't have my quiet time. Dude, it's all grace anyway, whether you had your quiet time or not. That he chooses simply by his unmerited favor to use you in the lives of other people, to use you to minister to other people. Not because you worked up some sort of superficial outward spirituality. Then just start speaking in these and thous. But it's simply because of his grace. This is so critically important because we hold ourselves back so often because we think, oh, I'm not worthy. Newsflash, you never were. You never are. The only thing that makes you worthy is his worthiness. And so this is so critically important for the Christian life because in a sense it's the unction, the power behind it because you realize, hey, you look at other people like a Billy Graham or like a Chuck Smith or anyone else you want to name and you think when you get a handle on the grace of God, oh, why not me? Why not? He used them. Why can't he use me? And you're exactly right. He can. And there's nothing stopping if you have been saved by his grace and you're looking to, depending on his grace, you're submitted to him, he will use you. Now it does say, in Jude, he says, keep yourselves in the love of God. Keep yourself in that position, that understanding of, of the grace, the mercy of God, where he can use you. And again, that's simply by understanding his grace. Now, oh. The apostles in Jerusalem recognized that Paul was preaching the same gospel that they were. They had received it from the Lord just the way he had. They had nothing to add except that, excuse me, I've had this tickle on my nose here that I... There we go. Then... <laughs> So they said they wanted him to minister to the poor, and which is a funny thing that they said that because that's what he was there in Jerusalem doing. He came to, brought, to bring famine relief. He came to bring it to them. So it was kind of superfluous, the thing that they added on there. But now in verses 11 through 16, we see that the gospel is defended against hypocrisy. We've seen it defended against legalism, against divisiveness. Now we see, the, 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 we see it defended against hypocrisy. Now, beginning here in verses 11 and 12, you see, we read, now, when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, <coughs> excuse me, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. God had used Peter to welcome Gentiles into the church without first becoming Jews. Peter had also affirmed Paul's ministry to the Gentiles when he came to Jerusalem, as we saw in verse 9. 
Peter visited Antioch at some point around this time and participated in their love feast. Their love feast is like our fellowship feast. They would have potlucks, church come together, people bring different dishes, they share, give them time to fellowship, express oneness to one another, you know. And, and so they would regularly do that. Before these people came down from Jerusalem, Peter would hang out with all the Gentiles, you know, and all, all eat pulled pork sandwiches with them, and everything would be fine. These guys came down, it says, from James, from Jerusalem. All of a sudden, they were of the circumcision, which means they taught that you had to be circumcised. So he withdraw, then withdraws in the fellowship feast and in the sense they are a love feast and they go sit at another table and don't have anything to do with the Gentiles. Now, James, who is the half-brother of Jesus, later said in Acts chapter 15... Verse 24, he said, yeah, these, I, these people came down from us, but we didn't tell them to share that. We didn't tell them to, they were teaching stuff we didn't tell them to say. And so he makes this point again about the gospel, what the gospel actually is. And it states here, excuse me, Paul states here that the reason God given for Peter's withdrawal was that he feared these men who were from the circumcision. Proverbs 29, 25 says, the fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. There's a fear that's actually rooted in pride. In Matthew chapter 26, we learn a couple of things about Peter. Let's flip there for a second. I want to show you at least one part of that. Matthew 26 Beginning with verse 33, Jesus had shared with them shortly before he's going to the cross. He's sharing with them that that's what's going to take place. And then in verse 33, Peter responds. He says, Peter answered and said to him, he talked back to Jesus, not a good thing to do. Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I, I will never be made to stumble. Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Then later in the chapter, we have, of course, things transpire. They go to the garden the, God, the rabble comes, arrests Jesus. Peter ends up in the courtyard of Caiaphas's house as Jesus is being tried before Caiaphas. Young girl comes up to him. Aren't you one of them? Nah, I don't know what you're talking about. Your speech betrays you. That you're a Galilean. Aren't you one of his disciples? I don't know the man. Three times he denies the Lord then. Why? Because you, what you see taking place here, remember, he made that claim, so everybody else deny you. I won't do it. Pride. But that, that same pride in this other situation, worried about what people think, that he denied the Lord. So fast forward back to Antioch, the situation Paul's writing about. 
Here he is. Ah, oh, it's great in here eating these ribs. Here with the Gentiles. Guys come from Jerusalem. Ooh. He's worried about what they think of him. So as you see, this is a subtle, very dangerous thing that I have to admit that the Lord has slammed me about before. Because yeah, you can be afraid in this situation, but ask, your, ask the question, what are you afraid of? It's the fear of man, as we read from Proverbs, that brings a snare. And that fear of man is so often rooted in pride how I look to other people. What should matter is how you look to the Lord. The reason that Paul found it necessary to confront Peter was that his actions were a denial of the gospel. When he withdrew, it's like saying you had to get to get be saved to be a believer. You have to be a Jew. You had to start observing the law. It's great, little this probably this confrontation probably set Peter straight. Because when they had the Jerusalem council later that was over this issue, that's in Acts chapter 15. In verse 11, Peter says, But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they, referring to the Gentiles. This should be an issue that every believer is sensitive to about that's why it matters when people make statements like people getting to heaven because they're good people news flash there aren't any of those not you not me there are no good people We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're not going by man's relative standards. Oh, he's in better. he doesn't kill anybody. He's a good person. But by God's standard, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. We hear a lot of talk today about people of faith. But if there's only one name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It's not in keeping the Ten Commandments. It's not in anything other than the faith that's in Jesus Christ. Now in verse 13 we read, and the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. Other Jewish believers fell into Peter's hypocrisy because they held him to be held him in such high regard. Oh, that's Peter. He's doing this, and it must be okay. It must be what we're supposed to do. Never think that any sin you might commit is a small thing and it doesn't affect others. Think about this. Basically, all Peter did was change tables. Small thing. But led those people, led the other believers there into his hypocrisy. Paul confront, confronts Peter's a sin publicly because his sin was committed publicly. In Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 and following, 
you can read this later. We're not going to get into it for time's sake. But it tells you when to confront uh, a brother who sins against you and how to do it. Now, in verses 14 through 16, we read, But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is justified, or is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. That's what he confronted Peter with. You're living like a Gentile. Jews come, the Jewish guys come. You separate with them, and you're still trying to, get, you're trying to get Gentiles to live like Jews. What's up with that, Peter? He's saying, we believe plainly that we're saved by grace through faith. That's it. Peter and the others weren't straightforward with the gospel in that they allowed the observance of the law to be added in. It would be like saying that the Gentiles weren't really believers because they weren't keeping the law. Paul reminds Peter that he wasn't keeping the law, so don't try to lay that trip on other people. He and Paul had both grown up as observant Jews, and they realized what a bondage to them the law was. So don't lay that on anyone else. A person can only be justified by faith in Jesus Christ. As it says in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, for by grace you have been saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which he's prepared beforehand that we should walk in him. The gospel. That Jesus paid the price for our sins, that if, as the scripture says, who anyone who receives them, who repents of their sin, place their faith in Jesus Christ alone for their salvation, they have eternal life. And then God, through his grace, works through your life. Simple as that. Nothing added. Nothing to distract from that. So the first question for each of us is, do you believe the gospel of grace? The second question is, are you standing firm in the gospel of grace in the face of opposition? The gospel needs to be defended against legalism, divisiveness, and hypocrisy. It's the only way to stay true to Jesus in this age of apostasy that we're living in. So many people falling away. So many people teaching other things other than the gospel. We, as a church not just here, but the church as a whole, needs to stand firm on the gospel of grace. It's not liberty in this, or or excuse me, license in the sense that do whatever we want. And at the same time, neither is it legalism, adding anything to faith in Christ. But it is so cool when we get an understanding, a grasp of his grace, knowing 
that he can and will work in your life solely because of his grace. And you can rest in that. You can stand on that. You can depend upon that. Because he loves you. And that's why he did what he did. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for your word and your grace, Lord, that's so incredible towards us, Lord God. That you work in our lives simply by your grace. Lord, so we thank you for that, Lord God. Just help us to stay anchored to your word and trusting in your work in our lives, Lord, that we might, as we experience your love, Lord, overflow to other people. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.